What is up, everybody? Mr. Pertis, welcome to 5.2. This is the second part, or I'll call it part B. Part A was on the causes of political revolutions in America. This is part B. We're doing a little outcomes of the revolutions in America. There will be a part C that's on nationalism, and then we'll combine 5.2 into one nice little neat package and move on. So this is 1450. Man, I'm going back in time. This is 1750 to 1900. Again, this is our third major time period, circa 1200 to 1450. 1450 to 1750, 1750 to 1900. And I guess I just did that for myself because you probably already know that. So let's rock and roll. So again, quick friendly reminder, we're talking about three main revolutions, the US, Haiti, Spanish Latin America. And before we get into some of the outcomes, I do want to mention one thing that the AP College Board requires that you know, and there are some important documents that are going to be written that either were started or written during the revolutions that um, they want you to know. So I want to point out these three. If uh, we'll read these in class or read excerpts from these in class because the documents are really long and hard, but we'll kind of break some of these down. And what they really want you to know is that there's the Enlightenment is going to inspire documents that those documents are then going to inspire future documents. So there's a lot of inspiring going on here. I feel inspired. Do you? Um, so here's what we got. First is the Declaration of Independence. This declared independence for the American colonies from the British Crown in 1776. Specifically, it was issued or proclamated on July 4th, 1776, which is why if you are an American citizen or living in America, we celebrate Independence Day on that day. The second is the Declaration of the Rights of Man. I told you you don't need to know the French Revolution in the last video, but there is one exception to that, and that is this. Although you don't need to know anything specifically about the French Revolution, AP College Board does want you to know that they do write what is called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen during the French Revolution, which was essentially their Bill of Rights. And if you don't know what that is, that is the rights that are guaranteed to all people in France, well, at least of man and of citizens. So not necessarily everybody, but at least half the population. Um, a little gender inequality here, but that's another story for another day. And also there's one more. It's called the Letter from Jamaica also known as the Jamaica Letter, written by Simon Bolivar, which if you don't remember, he is the leader of the Latin South American revolutions. He's a great military general and often seen as kind of the equivalent of George Washington in the 13 colonies. And he writes that about the Latin American revolutions in 1815. So I wanna point out those three. I don't wanna go into too many more details about what they say, because but what they say is that it's all about the enlightenment. So. Um, I do want to make sure you have that in your notes and you kind of see that in case you that pops up again. These are three things that could definitely be on a multiple choice question um, on the uh, AP World Exam and a little excerpt of it. So let's get into some outcomes here. We got outcomes of we're going to go American, Haiti and Latin America again. If you're taking notes on this, um, I don't know, just put it wherever you're taking notes on, I guess. I, I don't need to critique your note taking abilities, but um, We'll compare, so I want you, there's two real things here. We gotta, we're gonna compare the causes and outcomes or the causes of each place and the outcomes of each place and then also kind of put it side by side. So what were the causes and what were the outcomes of the American Revolution, causes and outcomes of Haitian? Here's the outcomes. First is, this is going to be, in the American Revolution, we are creating the first democracy since the classical period. So since the Greco-Roman period, going back from a year ago for you. And this is gonna be based on enlightenment ideas and enlightenment principles. So the Constitution of the United States of America, which is um, 1787, so after the American Revolution is done, it's essentially written a couple years later, and this is the laws that govern the American federal government. And what it says is basically that no one is above the rule of law, everyone must follow the law, there's separation of powers, and it basically gives what each branch of government has the right to do and how each branch can check the other branch of power. After they write the Constitution and that is passed, they also pass a Bill of Rights, and this becomes the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, the way the Constitution is, things that are added to the Constitution. And essentially what the first 10 amendments do is the goal is to guarantee rights of citizens that can't be taken away. Now remember, consent, um, social contract says sometimes these rights need to be limited, but in essence, these rights, these 10 original um, rights that are in the, Const or in the Bill of Rights are not to be taken away ever barring another amendment that would over usurp or supersede, wow, good word for today, supersede, to overtake or cancel out the other amendment. But none of those first 10 amendments have ever really been taken away. The second is the lack of equality still continues. Remember, independence versus revolution. We're talking about a revolution, but we're really not changing the social structure. Um, slavery is gonna keep on going. Slavery 
from the early 1600s. It's going to exist in the United States until 1865. And then even after that, when African-Americans are freed, they're still really put into almost like an indentured servitude in what's called sharecropping, where they're really legally limited, financially limited. And it's really not until the 1960s with the Civil Rights Act in the United States until 1964, where full, not even full, close to being full politically equal is uh, implemented. So it's really a hundred year period and we're talking 1865 and again this constitution was written in 1787 it's a long freaking time um also let's not forget the women women are not given the right to vote in the united states based on the constitution they're not really even talked about in terms of the constitution the bill of rights they're really just ignored and it's not until the 1910s um, that women are granted equal uh, voting rights in the United States um, and really have limited legal protections based on the law until the 1900s. Lastly, and this is the obvious one, the American colonies are free of British rule. The British are gone. The Americans are, can set up their own government like we've just talked about so far. Unlike what we're going to see in the next two outcomes, the American government really thrives economically. So because of the loose control that existed in the colonial period, they have the base and the institution to become free and start building their own industry and starting to trade. So let me say it again, because of the limited control under British rule in the previous time period and mercantilism wasn't strict in North America, the colonies are able, or now the 13 states, are able to really thrive economically and grow. This is different than the next two. So here's the outcomes in Haiti. Haiti becomes, now this, they get their independence in the early 1800s, like maybe 20 years, give or take, after the American Revolution, and they become the first non-slave democracy ever. So in their constitution, they outlaw or ban slavery and set up a democracy. This is the first time in the history of the world, which is pretty cool, that a democracy, there is a democracy that bans slavery. It's a really, this is like, you got to imagine, word travels of this Haitian revolution into other parts of the, of the Americas, and slaves are going to hear about this, and it's going to inspire some slave rebellions in the United States, in other places in the Caribbean, where people say, if Haiti can do it, we can do it, and they're going to rise up. It's not as successful as Haiti. Haiti had a large slave population, um, and it's a much more contained space um, because it's half of an island, so it was a little bit it was more realistic in Haiti when it's not so much, it was much more difficult for slaves to rise up successfully in, let's say, the southern part of the United States. They are going to struggle economically in Haiti. Um, one of the big issues is they had the industry that had been set up in Haiti was a single crop economy. They really, most of the farms only planted sugar. And now that you're free, you're still going to continue to plant sugar and you need to rely on other countries to buy your sugar. So they're still going to become very connected to France in terms of selling that sugar. So France is gonna to continue to really be able to exploit the prices of buying sugar um, and not much changes there economically because we had this strict mercantilism in the previous time period. Lastly, and after the slave rebellion happens, France is gonna force Haiti to pay reparations um, or to pay money to repair how the slaves took land from the slave owners. That fee, the reparations, were not paid off by Haiti until 1947. So Haiti is going to pay between the end of the revolution and the early 1800s until 1947. So a lot of that money is leaving and going to France, continuing to enrich the pockets of the French. And lastly, this race-based system remains. You'd think, oh, slavery's over, everyone's equal. Yay, white people and black people, kumbaya, sitting around the campfire, high-fiving and doing secret handshakes. None of that happens. This is going to, the people who are of mixed ethnicity, European and African are still going to dominate government and economics. So they are still going to be the ones in charge. And those who are freed slaves are still going to be at the bottom of the social class pyramid. Can they vote? Sure. But does that really equal economic power and equality? No, because you still need ways to own your land. You need ways to sell the product that you're growing. And all of that stuff really still relies on France and the people who were in power before in Haiti. So that's number two. Last but not least, we have Latin American revolutions. In Latin America, like we mentioned, if you remember, one of the causes was this unequal social class and these Creoles, these Spanish, full-blooded Spanish born in Latin America, that's what I'm looking for, are going to basically replace the peninsulares. So they're gonna move themselves up and put themselves at the social class pyramid and essentially rule the same way the peninsulares did minus the Spanish being in charge. So this racial discrimination of essentially the light of your the lighter your skin in Latin America, the higher you are is going to continue on. And that's going to continue with the Creoles. Second, they are also going to struggle economically. 
here's the theme if you're not getting this north america had very loose mercantilism latin america and the caribbean very strict mercantilism when you gain your freedom in spanish latin america you don't have the industries in place to make to make it successfully on your own so because nothing is in place to create their own industries they're still going to need to rely on europe um, to trade now it's not required they could trade with other countries but really they need the european market the european um, money to buy their products and buy their goods and really a lot of the places in latin america are going to rely on the cash crop economy they're really reliant not on making your own things and industry they're really relying on farming and agriculture and then selling these products to make money um, whether it's tobacco sugar cotton um, whatever the case might be also last but not least there is going to be an attempt in latin america especially south america to unify south america and even Central America into one unified country. And it's not, it, t today it might sound far fetched, but back then it was not much different than uniting the 13 colonies up here. The idea was we will unite all these into one country and each country will be its own state. Um, and Simon Bolivar, who we talked about as like the leader of the Latin American revolutions, he tries to do this, but it's really, it just turns out to be unsuccessful um, because over time, the cultural differences that emerge between, for example, Colombian and Venezuelans and uh, or Colombians and Ecuadorians become so great that that the differences become so pronounced even though they're really all derive essentially from a very similar culture the geographic barriers and with um, mountainous structures and rainforests separate these people so much that the attempts to unify fail um, so these this attempt to unify Latin America is totally unsuccessful so those are three outcomes. We have three causes of each, three outcomes of each. Hopefully it makes sense. I know it's a little choppy here. Um, we'll piece it back together in class and kind of look at some of the characteristics, but hopefully we're pulling enough in from the past time period that you get it. As always, you got any questions, you write it down. Let me know. I'm out.